So today I'm going to do a follow-up video to the one I did yesterday on the Transfiguration Prophecy where I talked about Jesus and Moses and Elijah appearing on the mountain and the three disciples who are with them. And I also talked about how the Transfiguration, according to Peter in 2 Peter chapter 1, was prophetic. And Jesus even told his disciples don't tell anyone the vision until after Christ or until after he was raised from the dead. So there is something about this transfiguration moment with Moses and Elijah and the disciples that has end time fulfillment. That's my take. And of course, in the process of talking about Moses and Elijah and end time fulfillment of the two witnesses that we read about in Revelation 11, uh, people have so many questions and are very perplexed about who exactly are the two witnesses. So that's what we're going to be talking about in this video. I hope to answer some questions that you may have about their identity. So there were a number of questions that people left in the comments section and what I tried to do is basically just sort of consolidate the questions and come up with the sort of the synthesis of what were the most common questions and uh, observations and you know conundrums that are associated with the two witnesses and the first question that I want to address is are the two witnesses actually just symbolic? Are these not even really people at all? Could they, for example, be the law and the prophets, like Moses representing the law and Elijah representing the prophets? Could it be the New Testament and the Old Testament that are being referred to as being the witnesses uh, that are talked about in Revelation 11? Well, there are a couple of problems with that theory in that the two witnesses are going to be martyred. They're actually going to die, and their, their bodies are going to lie in the streets of Jerusalem for three and a half days, and then they're going to resurrect and ascend. And I don't think that the Word of God will ever die. The Word of God is living and active, and it's never going to pass away. So there is no way anyone can kill either the Law and the Prophets or kill the Old and New Testaments. And even the, um, the idea that the Law and the Prophets uh, came to an end when Christ died and resurrected is only partially true. The requirements of the Law were put to rest when Jesus died. But there's more to the Prophets than just the legal requirements of the Law of Moses. There's also the whole idea of a millennial reign, of someone sitting on David's throne. All of that is part of the Prophets. So those things are not going to be fulfilled until after Christ returns. So there isn't a way that the Law and the Prophets can actually be in the past because these prophecies are actually going into the future. So is it possible that the two witnesses are actually two groups of people that we're not talking about individuals, two individuals, but two groups of people, for example, uh, the Jews and maybe Gentiles, or we could be talking about Israel and the church. So again, we have this problem that the two witnesses are going to die and lie in the streets of Jerusalem. So if these are two groups that are martyred in, in Jerusalem, how many people are we talking about? Are we talking about thousands? Are we talking about millions? Uh, are, are these all Jews and all Christians who are going to be being killed? Is there room on the streets of Jerusalem for all these people to be lying, these dead bodies to be lying everywhere? And if we're talking about thousands of people who are dead all over in the city, um, are they going to all resurrect at once and all ascend from the Mount of Olives, which I believe is the location where the two witnesses will ascend from? So, I don't think it's likely that we're talking about two groups of people. The two witnesses are associated actually with two miracles. They're associated with water to blood and with uh, the rain being held for three and a half years. So, 
it's hard to associate those miracles with two groups of people, right? So I think it's more likely that the two witnesses are two individuals, not two groups of people. So if they are two individuals, then um, we have to kind of narrow this down too. So are they Moses and Elijah? Are they Elijah and Enoch? Because we know Elijah was taken up in a whirlwind into heaven, and we know that Enoch uh, was translated. He was walking with God, and he was not, for God took him. Or the third option is, are these two people who come in the spirit and in the power or the anointing of Elijah and Moses? In other words, they're not Elijah and Moses, but like John the Baptist in the first century who came in the spirit and power of Elijah, are we just talking about two regular people who have this anointing? Well, this seems to me to be a, a more logical um, possibility. And remember, Revelation is full of allusions. That is, they're little words or phrases uh, that jog our memory so that we think back to something that happened in the past. So as soon as we're talking about water to blood, we automatically think of Moses. He's the only one who had the power to do that. And of course, Aaron had the power to do that too, but only in the presence of Moses. And Elijah was the one prayed and it didn't rain for three and a half years. There's nobody else who did that. So when Revelation is making these allusions back to Old Testament stories, we're actually talking about two people, two specific people, that is Moses and Elijah. So I think it's more likely that we would be pursuing the avenue of Moses and Elijah. So this brings us to a problem. We don't have a problem with Elijah. Um, Elijah was taken up in a whirlwind, and it's very possible he can come down in one or just come down however he's going to. Obviously, Elijah's still alive, and Enoch is still alive, but we'll get to um, Enoch in a little minute here. But Moses, Moses died, okay? The book of, I think it's Deuteronomy or one of those Old Testament books says that Moses climbed up a mountain, he died, and God buried him. And there are these passages, and somebody asked me about this in the comments section, this passage in, in Hebrews, Hebrews 9.27, that talks about um, it's appointed unto man once to die, and after that the judgment. And if Moses was resurrected somehow, you can only die once, you can't die twice. Well, actually, the passage in Hebrews 9 is is. The point of that passage is that Jesus would only have to die once. He did, wouldn't have to be put to death multiple times. So go and look at that passage. It's Hebrews 9. It's at the end of the chapter. And, and you'll see you know, that that's the primary interpretation of that passage. However, there were people in the Bible who died and were resurrected. And the most famous one, of course, is Lazarus. But also, we have uh, the son of the widow of Nain that Jesus raised. We have Jairus' daughter. And then in the Old Testament, we have the Shunammite's son who was raised by Elisha in 2 Kings chapter 4. And then in the book of Acts, we have this young man, Eutychus, who fell off the window, <laughs> and uh, Paul raised him from the dead. So, technically, a person can be raised from the dead, which meant they died once. They're not in an immortal or glorified body. They're, they're resurrected back into their mortal body, and then they would die a second time. Okay, and this does not contradict the passage in Hebrews 9, because that passage isn't talking about people who have been resurrected and then um, have to die twice. It's talking about Jesus and how he only has to die once. We also know that Moses was present at the time of the transfiguration, and he wasn't a ghost. He wasn't a ghost or a spirit. Uh, nobody ever suggested that he was. There was Elijah in his body, and there was Moses in his body, and the passages also state that they appeared in glory and you have to remember that whenever people enter into the presence of God, they take on some of the glory. So in the Old Testament, after Moses had been on the mountain or any time he was talking with God, 
his face reflected God's glory so that he put a veil over it. It's not that Moses was glorified. It's just that that the glory was like all over him <laughs> from the presence of God. So Moses was alive. He was very much alive at the time of the transfiguration. So how'd that happen? How'd that happen that he could be alive? Well, it's most likely that Moses was resurrected, but he was not resurrected into an immortal or a glorified body. Uh, he, that's not possible because Jesus had to be the first one who was resurrected into immortality and glorified. He is the first. He's the first fruits of those who sleep. That is, he's the first one, and the first fruits are always the promise of more to come. So Moses would have been resurrected back into his old body and then brought into heaven, or it could have been, and I think this is most likely, that his body was taken into heaven first and then resurrected there. So Jude 9 has this very interesting kind of weird little discussion between Michael and Satan, and it's about the body of Moses. But even the archangel Michael, when he disputed with the devil over the body of Moses, did not presume to bring a slanderous charge against him, but said, the Lord rebuke you. Michael apparently was charged with bringing the body of Moses or doing something with the body of Moses. And I believe he was going to be taking that body into heaven and it would be resurrected or he would be resurrected here on earth and then brought into heaven. Either way, it doesn't matter that Moses got his body back. It wasn't a glorified body and it wasn't an uh, immortal body. So apparently Satan thought he had a claim on Moses' body, but God overruled him. So the second question then was Moses glorified. Uh, Moses was not glorified for the reasons that I've already stated that Christ was the first fruits and no one could be raised to immortality or glorified until Christ was raised and glorified. So Jesus is the first fruits. Everyone else, every single other person has to await the end times in order to be resurrected. So if you're a believer or you're a person of faith, you will be resurrected before the millennium begins. And if you're an unbeliever, you will be resurrected at the great white throne judgment. So Hebrews 11, 39 and 40 talks about people of faith in the Old Testament and how none of them are resurrected yet. None of them. They are in heaven. They're that cloud of witnesses. And this is what it says. These all were commended for their faith. Yet they did not receive what was promised. God had planned something better for us, that together with us, they would be made perfect. They're going to inherit all the promises, including a resurrected and glorified body, at the same time that we uh, receive the promises of God. It's all at the same time. So let's talk about Enoch. What about Enoch? And a lot of people think that Enoch is one of the two witnesses because he never died. I think the uh, chances of Enoch being one of the two witnesses uh, are um, pretty s slim, mostly because of the biblical allusions in Revelation 11 that allude back to water to blood, that's Moses, and three and a half years of drought, that's Elijah. There are no miracles associated with Enoch that are mentioned in Revelation 11, where it talks about the two witnesses. So what was the purpose of Enoch being taken? Okay, so he's in heaven right now in a mortal body. Okay, he's not immortal yet because he, like all the other people of faith, have to wait so that we can all do this together. Hebrews 11.5 talks about Enoch, and I believe Enoch is a type of believer who will never die. Someone who will be transformed and put into an immortal body and never taste death. So Hebrews 11.5, by faith Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death. And he was not found because God had taken him. Now before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. 
And this is what it says about believers who will not taste death either. This is in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 51 through 53. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In an instant, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For the perishable must be clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality. So that is um, what we will get. And, th- and we have to be changed from mortal to immortal and, and have this um, imperishable body in order to inherit the kingdom. Okay, that's, that's how that works. So in summary, the two witnesses are most likely Moses and Elijah. They had and continue to have, because this was never taken away, the power to do the miracles of turning water to blood and causing a drought for three and a half years. Those things are mentioned in Revelation 11. And they are in mortal bodies, so they will be able to die. So after three and a half days, they will be resurrected into an immortal body, and then they will ascend. And I believe they will ascend from the Mount of Olives. This is at the time of the second woe, which is, I believe, on the same day as the abomination of desolation. They will do this from the Mount of Olives in the same hour they ascend. There will be this great earthquake in Jerusalem. Tenth of the city will fall and 7,000 people will be killed. So uh, they are people. They are two individuals. They are Moses and Elijah. And um, that's how I get there. (laughs) So uh, leave a comment in the comments section. We'll see you on another video. Till then, have a blessed day. Mm -hmm.